I'm here with Jeff Burgess at the Can-Am 50th event and we're here we're going to talk about more uh, recent Can-Am bikes and and his history with the Can-Am project. Today. Good, fine, and now it's warmed up. That's I'm right. I'm from Florida, so I'm a sissy. So you know our friend Smitty that I talked oh, to over Smitty, in yeah. the... I, uh, yeah, Smitty, as you pro probably know, he was world champion in 64, 65, and I joined BSA, who he worked for, of course, uh, in 1966, 19, yeah, 66, right. Uh, and uh, I raced also when I was there. I raced a BSA B40 and a CZ250. And so he was international. He was racing on the Moto uh, the Grand Prix circuit. And I was just around where I lived in the middle of England, it's West Midlands. So, uh, he, uh, I was doing production motorcycles. That was my job. But there was a lot of people who raced motor scrambles back then and uh, so we got to know each other and uh, when BS, BSA went under and went bankrupt in 1972 I emigrated to California and I got a job with uh, Monarch and Marty Smith's race engineer from Monarch and then moved back got married moved back to Pennsylvania uh, in 74 went to Unadilla uh, racetrack in uh, New York State and there was Smitty in the Can-Am truck and one of the ri riders that he had was a guy called Ronnie Matthews, Northern Irishman, crazy as hell, you know, <laughs> but that's, that's probably good for being a racer. Uh, and I got talking to Smitty and he said, well, what are you doing now? I said, well, I'm going to go back to California because there's no work around here. And, and he said, no, nope, you're coming to Valcor and work for Can-Am as an engineer. I'm looking for an engineer. Like you, because I know your capabilities. So I'd worked in Britain for uh, Norton, or oh, it became Villiers, which became Norton Villiers, and then Triumph BSA Group. Uh, and so I had a all round knowledge of two stroke, four stroke uh, engines, chassis. So um, he said, We need something like that for Can Am. So he said, I'll, I'll do the paperwork, get the paperwork going, and then you come up when it's done. So I joined them in April 1976. And like I say, in, in Can-Am Engineering, uh, worked on the MX-4, redesigned the suspension, rear suspension on the MX-3 for making the MX-4, and all the way, MX-5, MX-6, and the ridiculous uh, MX-7, which never made production, but some prototypes were made. So. And then in 82, uh, the, when Can-Am was closed, um, they made me director of uh, research for Sea-Doo, ski -Doo, and Can-Am. Can-Am's motor, uh, motorcycles were then made in the UK, in England, with the Armstrong uh, uh, motorcycle company, uh, which we imported. But the engines still had to be released to Rotex through Valcor. They wouldn't accept a customer to be in charge of the changes, etc. So I had that job to release all the engines for all the three brands and do all the development and uh, calibration for all the three three um, brands. So that was good. And 88 came and I thought, well, Can-Am's gone and I'm in Quebec and I got divorced. I'm going back to Detroit. So I went back to Detroit and then became a, a staff engineer for uh, General Motors working on suspension advanced, advanced design and then I found out that Polaris were looking for me to start off the motorcycle project so I became chief engineer for Victory Motorcycles oh, Victory. and started that yeah, from 94 to 2000. Nice. So we got that going. With, uh, with Can-Am what kind of things was it a group uh, when you're talking engineering was we, we spoke with another gentleman over there there was an engineer as well was it a group project, or were you tasked just the engines, or were you tasked to a certain part of the bike, or how did they, well, how did they, yeah. they go about it? Uh, there was, in 1976, something political happened in uh, Quebec, which English-speaking people didn't like, and they migrated back to Toronto, or California, wherever they're from. 
So there was a shortage of talent, engineering, and development technicians. So the projects that we did were, when, when I was at, see, I was, in Can-Am, we only worked on Can-Am. Then when I became director of R&D, I was involved with all the three brands. So, and I, I had about 52 engineers and technicians reporting to me to do the calibration work. So that was like a team on different products doing different calibrations. But the designs of the products were done by the Skidoo engineering or the um, Sidu engineering, which was starting off. So it was separate. And yeah. then after 82, there was no more Can-Am engineering done in Valpo. And the people were laid off. And that was all done with the Armstrong ASC models that came directly from the UK, from England. Yeah. So we didn't have any say in that other than the engines which were being continuously developed by Rotex. And so we let them know what was coming so they could modify the next year's bikes. It was team effort like everything is. So here the technicians and the engineers, the dyno people all worked as a team for Can-Am. When I asked you what bike you wanted to stand next to, you came, you actually indicated you wanted to be here. It, was there a reason? Yes. The reason why I was uh, hired by Jeff in Unadilla was because I was a two-stroke, four-stroke. I had two-stroke, four-stroke experience you know, from my previous work in the UK. And uh, Bombardier, Can-Am, Rotex had never made a four-stroke engine. And the EPA regulations which came out uh, starting uh, for motorcycles, starting in 1978, there would no longer be any two-stroke engines on the street. And Rotex, Rotex made um, only two, two strokes. strokes. Yeah. So we had to give Jeff and Myers opinions, ideas, and, and history on what four stroke should be. Now, Jeff rode a pushrod two valve VSA that had grown from originally 250 to 350 to 440 to 500. And he was happy with that. And he wanted to go down the same route, but I convinced him and Rotex, which didn't need much, not, you couldn't go that route because that was old school. And you had to have four valves, overhead camshaft, you had to have a balance shaft, and uh, that's the way we ended up. Excellent. Now, now, the original intention of the engine, we didn't design it as a competition engine, which everything is minimized uh, and, and, and uh, weight reduction, because the models that the marketing wanted was a road model, on road, off road model, and a motocross model. So we had to design the engine, of course, aesthetically to look for the, for the customers for the road model. Of course, they scrapped the road model, they scrapped the old non-road off-road model, and we ended up just with a four-stroke. But that engine has been um, the, the benchmark for, for four-strokes. It started off as a 499cc, and it ended up with a 620 in the Ro Woods Ro uh, Rotex um, wow. flat track bike. Right on. Yeah, so, and of course, the four stroke engine had to meet pollution restrictions, you know, EPA certified engine tailpipe emissions. So we had to take that into consideration in design. So the combustion, the fuel injection, oh, sorry, the combustion and, and the carburation had to be very fine, able to be very finely tuned. So it couldn't be a polluting motor. No. It looks, it looks kind of like the way the Honda's overhead valves are. Mm -hmm. yep. is, is it, was that a Can-Am thing first, or, or do they all kind of share that? Well, no. So basically, you have four different types of engines. A side valve, which is very old in the market. Then an overhead valve engine, which is push rod uh, activated valves. And then you have an overhead cam shafts and there's two versions of that there's a double overhead camshaft you have two separate cams and a single overhead camshaft which we decided to make so this is a single overhead camshaft engine four valve to give you the power the bore and stroke ratios ratios over over stroke which means that the bore is bigger than the stroke 
so we can rev higher to get more power. So all that was part of the development, uh, design development uh, strategy. Yeah. And so had a balance shaft to get rid of the vibration. Right, right. So this is a this is pretty much a, a, a pioneer in four stroke. For motor. Rotex. For Rotex. For Rotex. Yeah. yeah. We didn't invent anything new. We just took all the things that had been done before and <laughs> combined them in this motor. It didn't catch on at the start because uh, it was different, you know, like two strokes rule the roost and two stroke power and torque is superior to any four stroke engine of the same capacity. Yeah. It's something I want you to comment on uh, that, that one of the other people we talked to over there, they mentioned that there was an issue with the spark arresters on, on the original two strokes. Yeah. What, what was that about and how did they solve that problem? Well, uh, if you look around, there's there's a couple of bikes. I think that one over there has a, what they have called the veins in a, a cap oh. on the end. That captured the, any particles that came out of the engine uh, that would cause fire. Well, that was a spark arrestor. Uh, the to meet the uh, road on on road rules, that was not able to do that. But that was a uh, a pre pre. That, w that bike was in uh, 1977, yeah. and the emissions came in 78. I got so you. after that, we designed our own spark arrestor, uh, uh, that, that being the example there on the four stroke there, yeah. and uh, we overcame that. We overcame that by buying existing components from the aftermarket and then doing our own spark arrestor. We were, we were successful to do that. What, what's your feelings on uh, Can-Am coming back on the market uh, in 2024, 2025? Yeah, well, of course, they got the electric bike. And uh, that, to me, as an engineer, I've worked at General Motors and I've worked at you know, other places. And uh, that's the future. Definitely is the future for, for more than one reason, one of them being pollution because uh, of the mass of the vehicles amount of vehicles that run on the roads every day, you just can't keep doing that. That's no, no, yeah. that's right. So the electric electric vehicles are faster, they're lighter, they're not cheaper, they're more expensive, but um, the performance is unbelievable. I don't know if you've ever driven one. No, off, I haven't. Off either. the line, it's just smoke a Corvette. Yeah, oh you know, yeah, yeah. It's a standard SUV. So yeah. yeah, no, that's great. Oh. Yeah. Well, listen, thank you so much for your time today. Oh, you're welcome. I have a question. You do? Yeah. What are these? What are these on the side? Is that no, to that, that's the shock. No, that is. Um, see when, you, okay, with any shock absorber. See the, the tubes there. Yep. When you insert that tube into the bottom part, uh, you know, of the fork, there's, there's a volume change. Yep. So that volume change has to go somewhere, and it, what it does, it goes in there. This is a. What, what we usually call the uh, remote reservoir. Okay. And so that, that the amount of fluid, say this 20, 50 cc's of, of shaft that goes in there, yep. that 50 cc has to go in there and there's a bladder in there, a rubber bladder with a pressure, as you can see on the top, and that just deforms the pressure, it takes yep. up that 50 cc. That's, that's uh, the same on, see on the back of the, uh, the, the back of the Yeah, bike. so it's a piggyback. So, uh, yeah, so yeah, it's, it's a, really, a piggyback. I've just, I just never seen remote reservoirs where they put them on the, on the forks, yeah. no, the that, that basically at the wheel. Most of them, your remote reservoirs are up higher. Well, that it's right? because it, it has to turn, so you oh, can't have yeah, hoses. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. so when yeah. turn, if it's on yeah. the fork like that, then there's no worry about breaking hoses when there you go. There's that's no hoses. Smart. Remote <laughs> integral <laughs> integrated oh. remote reservoir. Yeah, that's it's really technical. Do you, do you have an engineering innovation for Can Am that you're really proud of? That well, you were you uh, that that was, you know. Yeah, there's a few of them. Uh, MX6, if you look at the you MX6 find one? bike, yeah, the scoops uh, on the headstock, you know, where, where the forks are here. Yeah. We call this the headstock. Here. And on the, on the two strokes, the backbone comes up to here. And what we did is we put two scoops, one either side, and we draw the air from there, which then goes through the filter to the engine. So now you can ride in water up to here, whereas before, you get you get underwater with the carburetor and everything. So oh, that's yeah, right. So that we, was that that was a big innovation that we did. In that's a, We looked at one where the intake where the air was coming in through the seat. Yeah. So they've actually changed it in later years to come in through here. Yeah. Right. So it was all waterproof. 
their air entry was all waterproofed and these scoops took the air in and also they eliminated the dust because you get dust from the front wheel coming up, thrown up and then it sucks the dust in. This is pretty much clean behind the uh, yeah. number plates. Yeah, nice. Yeah, nice. that's one of the things we're proud of. There's quite a few of them, but whatever, that's the job. Yeah, that's great. Well, I yeah. appreciate your time today. Oh, thank, thank you, you so much. Thank you. And, uh, and thank you for all the develop great developments on these projects. Yeah, it's a pity they you know, yeah. went under, but uh, a lot of, most of them went under, like a Buffalo Taco, Montesa, all these brands. They, they just, there was not enough volume to share around, so. No, no, The only right. one that survived is a KTM. I'd have wished the Can-Am would have been a KTM. Uh, that's they right. Did, they did it right. Thank you.